And next, we'll, next we will have uh, Dr. Felix Ringer from YITP at Stony Brook. And he's going to tell us about jet quenching and quantum algorithms. Felix, please go ahead. All right, well, uh, first of all, thanks a lot um, for the invitation and the opportunity to talk uh, for the organization of the really nice workshop. Um, yeah, so I'll talk about um, basically two topics um, that the organizer asked me to talk about. Um, they're, at the moment, I would say maybe a little bit separate topics, uh, one of jet quenching uh, and quantum algorithms, but hopefully in the not too distant future, um, these really will merge together and we can um, simulate things like jet quenching uh, with, with quantum computing. Um, so I'll talk about, um, of course, or, or our goal uh, in general um, is to understand data. Um, so we want to study jets uh, as shown here and want to understand how they get modified, for example, um, here in terms of the um, inclusive jet RAA, the, uh, the nuclear modification factor of it. Um, and <clears throat> one approach to this um, that I'll discuss is really a phenomenological approach. Um, and it's starting basically with factorization theorems and basically our like new un or new understanding of factorization theorems um, that we have um, in, in vacuum of, of various cross sections. Um, and so one of them is shown here. Uh, it's a factorization in terms of um, jet functions um, for inclusive jet production. Um, and so here basically the question is, um, how can we make use of this and how can we extend it um, to heavy ion collisions? Um, and hopefully we can test some kind of universality um, of these different components that appear here in this um, um, factorization uh, in the vacuum. And um, as I'll discuss, this also has applications directly um, to, to jet substructure, where also, of course, we have different and usually more, much more complicated factorization theorems. Um, so the question is basically how we can extend those um, to, to heavy ion collisions. Um, and then in the second part of my talk, um, I'll focus um, on our recent work um, on um, quantum computing. Uh, together with uh, Xiao Jun and also Bert de Jong, who, who gave a talk on, on Monday, uh, where, um, of course, a lot of progress has happened uh, in quantum computing. For example, um, this, uh, these recent sampling experiments that showed quantum supremacy of these um, quantum chips here, for example, from Google. Um, and sort of on the long, in, on the long term, um, the, the goal or the hope is um, that we can use these kind of devices to really um, simulate QCD scattering um, from first principle that is completely universally applicable. Um, and so that we can really basically simulate these kind of um, collisions in PP or in heavy ion collisions um, basically from first principles and really look at the real time evolution of these kind of things um, um, from first principles. So that's sort of the long term goal. And of course, we're still far away from that, but, but that's the, uh, the idea. Um, so, out of my talk, I'll talk about these two things the QCD factorization. Um, and how far that can get us in heavy ion collisions. And the second part then about um, open quantum systems and, and quantum simulations of that. Um, so let me get started with, um, by, by briefly reviewing the factorization um, of jet cross sections um, in, in vacuum. And so I, I briefly showed this factorization formula on, on the previous slide. And so uh, the main, uh, or one of the important ingredients here, if you want to think about jets or especially, especially inclusive jets and their substructure um, are um, so-called jet functions or inclusive jet functions. And what they do is they basically just measure um, how much energy of an initial parton is contained in uh, basically this inclusive jet sample. And so we can write that very similar to fragmentation functions. We can write as a function of some momentum fraction Z or energy fraction. And basically just tells us how much of some initial parton um, that we start out with that comes from some hard scattering um, actually ends up in any given jet that we find. Um, this is of course done in an inclusive way, basically the same way as an experiment. So if we have this kind of configuration as shown here in the upper right, then inclusive means we take really all the jets that we find and sort of on a um, theory level that basically means um, if we have these kind of part on branching processes, then um, whether we find basically one jet as shown on the left or on the right, we basically, or two jets as shown uh, on and the, uh, these two figures here, we'll basically take them no matter what energy they have. Um, and so that's very different than say like leading jet production um, for inclusive jets, we just take whatever they are. And so um, we can compute this say at next leading order, at leading order it's trivial, right? There's just one part and it's gonna be the jet. So the jet function is the delta function, but then beyond that, um, it has some non-trivial functional dependence on Z. And of course, um, whether we basically group these two partons into two jets or one jet will depend on the jet algorithm you're using. 
and uh, on the jet radius. And so um, one can basically see that here as a jet radius dependence, um, like a log in the scale divided by the hard scale times the jet radius. Um, and this law can basically be resummed um, to all orders and perturbation theory. Um, so what, what does this jet function look like? Um, that's shown here uh, on the right, that basically can give some intuition of what, what happens with jets. Um, and you can see that this, this functional form here looks very different than say a um, part to hadron fragmentation function. A fragmentation function falls off very steeply toward one, meaning it's very unlikely you find a hadron that carries almost all the energy of, in, of the initial um, parton. But for jets, it's actually very likely that you find basically one uh, jet relative to the initial parton that basically carries all the energy, basically just because you're grouping a bunch of hadrons together. So you get this peak. And then since we're inclusive, we'll not just get like a peak, but basically goes down. And then here sort of in the small Z region, you basically have like much you know, more softer sub uh, jets that you also produce. Um, and they basically populate this region here. So basically you just fill the histogram with all the jets. Um, and so, as I mentioned, we can resum this log. So if we want to go to smaller radii, which is, of course, what we do in heavy ion collisions, um, then um, this jet function changes. Um, and it changes in the following way that this peak that we had here for large radii will basically disappear slowly, so sort of smoothly evolves away, uh, according uh, to the um, renormalization group equation, which turns out to be just DGLAP. Um, and this, so this peak disappears and instead we basically get an enhancement here in the small z region that basically just means your leading jet will have less energy and you'll have much more smaller jets um, that will also appear here in your histogram. And so that's illustrated here on the bottom left. So instead of having, for example, a large radius that would capture all of those four partons, uh, if you have a small radius and say you would recluster those basically as three separate uh, and individual jets. And so this evolution, this transition from large to small radii is basically governed by DGLAB. Um, as you can see that here are the ultra-liberated splitting functions. And so if you look at the renormalization group equation, uh, we get DGLAB and we evolve it here between the hard scale and the jet scale, which is um, Q times the hard scale times the jet radius. And so then of course we have to put this into an actual factorization theorem. And so that's shown here, if we're interested here in um, say inclusive jet production, differential rapidity and transverse momentum, summed over all the jets uh, in, in the event, then um, the factorization structure is actually very similar to that for hadron. So we have two PDFs, some hard functions that basically produces initial hard parton. And then uh, we have here um, the jet function that basically gets convolved here with sort of everything else. Um, <coughs> so that's, that's basically the way to, we can compute inclusive cross sections of jets in, in vacuum. And just to illustrate that, the details are not too important, but basically this works very well um, uh, phenomenologically, even if the perturbative precision is not say at next to next to leading log um, yet, but it's at next to leading log, but you can see here roughly in orange here in this um, uh, uh, measurement here from CMS that basically looks at the jet um, size dependence, this really perfectly matches with the data. So it, it not only gives a very intuitive way to think about the transition from parton level to jets, in terms of these, these jet functions, but it also just works quantitatively um, uh, very well. Um, and the other point that will also then be relevant um, for heavy ion collisions um, is that basically whatever jet substructure observable you measure on an inclusive jet samples, um, these jet functions are always gonna be there. And so for many jet substructure observables, for example, if you look at, so it's just one uh, example, if you look, for example, at the theta G observable, the groomed uh, jet radius or opening angle, then um, in that case, we basically have to introduce um, jet functions that still contain all the terms that were in these inclusive jet functions, but they have like some additional terms as well. And so we can usually factorize those um, and the inclusive jet function that I talked about before can be factorized out in terms of uh, basically a quark fraction and a gluon fraction, and we basically have some leftovers um, that will uh, basically tell us about the different jet substructure uh, measurements. And then of course, this one has to change depending on um, the substructure measurement uh, uh, we're looking at that's basically observable dependent, um, but completely independent of the observable, these core gluon fractions, um, that's basically what contains these jet functions here, these inclusive jet functions that goes into these core gluon fractions, they will always be there. And so that's of course very important then for heavy ion collisions because if you want to look at something like universality, whether we can um, compute um, several observables simultaneously and in a consistent way, then basically all the substructure measurements that are done will always have to contain some kind of 
um, say not vacuum, but they will have to contain some universal component, say some, some medium, uh, 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 a core gluon fractions that are really just associated with the initial measurement of identifying um, an inclusive um, a jet sample, and we can then perform additional measurements. And so I'll get back to this, this point uh, later. So um, the, the questions uh, that we've been thinking about um, is whether we can now use in some way this kind of factorization also in heavy ion collisions, if we can extend it uh, in some way. So we want to start with this in, in vacuum that it gives a very intuitive way to think about it and also um, uh, works very well phenomenologically and how we can potentially extend that to a heavy ion collisions. Um, and in particular, we obviously want to make sure that um, we not only are able to extend this to heavy ion collisions for inclusive jets, but as I mentioned, whatever we get out here will appear basically for every single jet substructure uh, measurement that was done in heavy ion collision for inclusive jets. So we basically, if we basically find a way to do this here, this has an impact for whatever we do with jet substructure. And so ideally we should find that this also holds. And so that was sort of was one of the initial concern because there are several jet substructure measurements that are modified and some that are not modified. And so if we basically change here the core gluon fractions, um, then that really has to apply to all the jet substructure measurements. And it's, for example, very difficult to then to imagine that there are some observables that are unmodified because if I change my core gluon fractions here in some way for all the observables, then I will of course always induce some kind of shift unless there's some very special exceptions. Um, but then if there's no modification that would somehow have to be perfectly compensated for, and that's of course very unlikely to happen. And, um, and so in that sense, that was sort of one of the initial motivations. It's a little concerning if you see jet substructure that are completely unmodified, of course, with an experimental accuracy um, and, and so on. And so the question is then, can we basically try to make statements and can we find such a universality or, or is that causing problems? Um, and so what I'll talk about is really just a phenomenological approach, um, but um, I'll, I'll try to illustrate and try to convince you that that's at least reasonably successful. And then of course, that's like a starting point to not only have a, a basic phenomenological approach, but then um, to basically try to calculate these kind of in medium jet functions, um, for example, in an open quantum system uh, formulation. All right. So um, first, of course, we need to think about how um, this kind of factorization um, can be modified in heavy ion collisions. And so there's basically two components to this. There's the factorization structure um, and um, there's the evolution equations um, of the jet functions. And so one way one can think about the modification is basically take the same form. That's basically what we want to check. Is that form still useful or do we just have to throw it out completely and start somewhere else? Um, and so here um, is again the same form, but for example, we have to put in maybe nuclear PDFs here. Um, what we're using here is we just keep the hard scattering functions to be the same. This is basically at very high scales, far away from the medium scale. So we basically leave that um, to be the same. But then what we do um, basically modifies, we change um, the jet functions here in the final state. So generally we expect that um, there's maybe some additional uh, medium scatterings and they will basically lead to um, for example, more production of softer jets, but the leading jet will be, be more modified or will be softer. And so um, what we basically want to do is just try and see, is there like any jet function um, that we can basically just fit that can actually describe the data. Um, and that as it turns out is already um, quite non-trivial uh, to just find such a jet function. And so it's of course more difficult to compute from for trying to compute it sort of um, from in an open quantum system formulation. Um, or, or in any other formulation, um, but um, just finding that and just to see if there is any jet function, that's already um, actually surprisingly uh, difficult. Um, we could also imagine that there's a modification of the evolution equation, for example, in this form. Um, we don't consider this, or we did not consider this in this work here that I'll I'm talking about with uh, John Wei, uh, uh, Chu, Nabu, and Pia Zurita. Um, but in principle, we could also constrain that. So for example, if we find that it's not sufficient to just modify the initial conditions. So that's usually how nuclear PDFs and nuclear fragmentation functions are fitted. Um, but if we potentially have to modify the evolution, then we basically should see that ideally from the data that we actually have to do that. Um, and so um, we're currently not um, doing that here, but in principle, one, one could extend it if, if necessary. And so the way we set up basically a fit and the, the way we try to extract from data a medium um, jet function is in the following way. We um, basically take an initial condition um, at the jet scale. Um, we um, take the vacuum jet function and we convolve it with some uh, weight functions. They basically just parameterize 
the modification from vacuum uh, to medium um, uh, jet functions. And that's basically what we want to fit. Um, we take some unsets for this um, that's shown here as a standard unsets um, that's often used in, um, <coughs> in fits of say PDFs. Um, we also tried some modifications of this and it's not um, all that sensitive to what exactly we choose here. Um, we also require um, in the fit that mom momentum is conserved. Um, that's basically because we have inclusive jets. So at the jet function level, not at the event level, but at the jet function level, um, we basically enforce momentum conservation. So that basically means like, if we have this situation, say in the vacuum, then we allow it basically to shift around. So, um, but anything that's basically not contained, for example, the leading jet will show up somewhere else, right? So we'll have to show up somewhere else uh, in, in the event, at least in the factorization structure where that's um, um, satisfied. So um, with that set up, we then basically do um, a fit um, to the existing inclusive jet data. And that, um, so this fit is basically very similar to what you would do for, for nuclear PDFs um, or, or fragmentation functions. Um, uh, as, in, as in those references here. Um, so we can take a look um, at the data. This is in comparison then to um, the fit uh, we did. Um, and that's basically all um, the data that we had uh, available at the time uh, when, when we did the fit in, in, in 2019. Um, so of course, we could potentially update this with um, more data in the future. And I think we also might have to do a little bit better of a, a error analysis. Um, but overall, what you can see from those two panels, so the, the upper ones are um, for 2.7 TeV, the lower one for 5 uh, TeV, um, you can see that that's overall a, a pretty good description. Um, and also in terms of the chi-squared per degree of freedom, we basically get um, uh, something around one. So overall, the fit quality um, is, is pretty good. And it means that in general, we, we can um, find a consistent description. We can find a jet function um, that actually describes um, the, the jet RAA. Um, so that's basically a first indication that we can in some way make use of this and we don't necessarily have to throw out um, all the factorization that we proved uh, and introduced uh, in, in, in vacuum. Um, now the question is, what do those jet functions look like? Um, and that's shown here. They hopefully should look something reasonable. They should look basically the way we expected that there's a suppression um, of the jet functions um, of the leading jet and that's compensated for by more softer jets that appear because of these additional medium interactions. And so what you can see here uh, in those four panels is a ratio of the medium jet function um, divided by the vacuum jet function for quarks on the left and gluons on the right. And then it's again separated for these two um, different center of mass energies where we had data. Um, and so in general, that indeed looks um, the way we would hope. Um, so we do get a suppression uh, in both cases of um, quarks and gluons um, in uh, the large uh, Z region. So that basically means um, the leading jets are going to contain less energy, um, but then that's basically compensated for by a significant enhancement of the softer jets that are being produced. And that's, of course, generally what you expect from energy loss, right? that, that you produce more jets. And then for any given PT, you will then have, of course, less jets um, than you would have in the vacuum. So that's basically what's going to give you um, the, the jet RA. Um, and so in that sense, there are in medium jet functions that can actually um, uh, describe the data with somewhat large uncertainties in the small Z region. One could worry about threshold logs here. But to first approximation, it, it actually works um, um, quite well. Um, now, one of the things we noticed um, at the time when we did the fit is that if we now want to extract basically quark gluon fractions, so maybe I should be a bit more specific what I mean by that, um, it's really combining all of this basically together depending on whether here's a quark or a gluon. Um, that definition of how we define quark and gluon fractions is basically dictated by jet substructure. So whatever uh, we have to call quark and gluon fractions for jet substructure calculation, for example, like a theta G or ZG calculation, um, that's what we also call um, quark gluon fractions here, um, just for inclusive jet production. That's something that we can define at leading power uh, in uh, the jet radius. At subleading power, that could be somewhat ambiguous. Um, but as it turns out, phenomenologically, that's usually not relevant. So in that sense, we're lucky that, that we can, uh, you know, in, in that analytic framework, we can define very well what we mean. Um, by quark gluon fractions. They, of course, depend on the jet radius, they depend on the jet algorithm, and so on. And so what you can see here um, in, uh, in the upper panel are the quark gluon fractions in vacuum. So um, they basically go up 
um, as a, the quark fraction basically goes up as a function um, of the jet PT and the gluon correspondingly um, goes down. And <clears throat> so, and, and, of, and of course, with a, um, if you make the radius small, then the quark fraction also goes up. So uh, everything sort of behaves as one would intuitively uh, expect. And so what we found then, if we now use these medium jet functions that uh, do describe the data, we found that there's a huge shift basically toward um, quark jets overall. So it seems like these gluon jets that for example here 200 GeV that are almost making up, up to like 70%, they're really reduced significantly below 40%. And so we really have this, this, this um, very large difference that gluon jets are just quenched away and the quark jets kind of survive. And so you have this really um, significant shift toward quark jets. Um, and if we just look at inclusive jet data, then that's of course totally fine um, in, because it describes the data and well, that's just what we find. Um, but that of course has a has significant Im, uh, um, impact on how we then try to understand jet substructure data because that basically means whenever I look at any jet substructure observable for inclusive jets, um, would be different, say, for Z-tag jets, but for um, uh, inclusive jets, at least, I would always basically expect here a significant shift um, toward quark jets. So whatever jet substructure observable I look at, I will have a significant shift um, to, toward quark jets. And so here, basically, then the question is, does that still work? It, can we find that basically in data, or, or could that potentially um, um, be a problem? And so since we, since we did this with a couple of new um, data sets came out. And so I wanted to, to show a couple and see how um, basically this, this framework and the, the extractions we did here hold up and how far um, they can basically get us um, in trying to understand um, jet quenching and jet substructure. <clears throat> so the first thing to look at um, is not even jet substructure, <coughs> but um, CMS did a measurement of um, the jet radius dependence. Um, that's of course very interesting. That's kind of the first thing one has to do. And um, unfortunately, it has relatively large errors and it's a little bit difficult to really draw conclusions from it. Um, you can see here in these three panels, uh, there's not really something compared to here, but um, here, everything what is shown here is the jet RAA for inclusive jets relative to the jet RAA for jets with a jet radius of 0.2. Um, and you can see that in this higher PT bin for basically 500 uh, GB jets, um, our result here, um, uh, which is shown here, uh, agrees quite well uh, as within basically uh, the, the uncertainties. Um, here, this is like a little bit lower PT, um, it's a little bit off, um, but overall I would say we could probably easily include this in an updated fit and probably with better uh, analysis of, of our errors. Um, so overall um, that at least doesn't exclude that, that anything that we did was sort of not correct. Um, and, and at least in this bin, it at least kind of actually confirms sort of what, what, what we extracted. Um, so that's sort of a first step. If we just look at new data, uh, new jet radius dependence, then that kind of works. One also basically expects this kind of dependence, roughly speaking, because we know that the hadron RAA for inclusive hadrons is closer to one um, than the jet RAA. And so if you lower the radius, you expect that eventually you're gonna approximate the hadron RAA. And so that's basically what we find here. If we have this trend, then, then that would uh, eventually confirm that. So overall, um, this new data um, seems, seems okay with, with what we have. Now, um, one can go a step further and there has been a very recent measurement um, from Alice, um, <clears throat> a substructure measurement, which is actually very nice to, to test um, the universality of these medium jet functions. Um, so what they did is to first recluster an inclusive jet sample with a given jet radius, say um, capital R, and then uh, they looked um, basically um, at all the subjects that you can recluster with a smaller jet radius. You take all the particles and just run jet finding again for the particles in that jet that you found initially, but with a smaller radius. So you get not just one jet as illustrated here, but you of course get many jets um, so we basically get again an inclusive um, uh, subjet spectrum. <clears throat> and that's what you can see here. That's plotted here. And actually basically looks like the jet function. This is the result in vacuum. It basically looks like a jet function that basically peaks um, at both endpoints at zero and one. Um, and um, so that's uh, basically the substructure measurement um, of subjects, but it's very closely connected to um, the, um, the initial um, identification of, of the uh, inclusive um, uh, uh, jet um, sample. And that's basically reflected um, in the factorization um, theorem for that in vacuum. So 
if you want to look at a cross section now differential and the kinematics of the initial jet, so transverse momentum and rapidity of the green jet, of the initial jet. And then in addition, we're now triple differential also in the measurement of the energy spectrum here. Um, sorry, I should have uh, said that. So the, the momentum fraction here, ZR, is how much energy is contained in the subjects that you find relative to the um, total um, jet. And that's basically very similar to these hadron measurements that were done where you measure longitudinal momentum fraction of hadrons relative to the jet. This is basically at a subjet level. Um, so in the limit that you take R to zero, a small R to zero, you basically get back hadrons. And so the nice thing of this is that in this case, one can show in, in factorization uh, in vacuum, you basically get two jet functions. You get two inclusive jet functions, one um, for the initial jet of size capital R, and then another jet function for the subjects of size small r. And they're really the exact same thing. And so then one can, of course, now make the assumption where we have medium jet functions, we can try and see if we now basically replace both of these jet functions in that cross section with a medium jet function, can that actually describe the data? Um, so here we didn't do any further extraction. This is really just what we extracted from inclusive jet data and we basically just put it in twice. The first one will basically affect uh, the quark gluon fractions overall and the second one will directly affect the, the um, ZR distribution. And so this is really a very um, strong test, I would say, of, of universality. So not only can we find jet functions that work in medium jet functions, but here we can really directly test if some kind of universality holds and whether um, we can basically make use of vacuum um, factorization theorems and that they tell us something about the structure uh, in heavy ion collisions. And so as it turns out, um, this is actually pretty good as um, the, the data maybe still has a little bit large uncertainties, um, but still the prediction that we made basically goes right through all the data points. So here uh, in the upper panel, you can see the measurement um, from at least in PP collisions. And then there's some modification of that uh, shown here in red. And they, all we really did was to use the jet functions twice. And we get here the green curve. Um, and as you can see, this um, actually agrees really well um, with, with the data. Um, and of course, one hopefully one can eventually reduce the uncertainties on these measurements and, and um, you know, eventually, of course, one has to do a global fit of this, try and see if one can really um, get this with a good chi squared per degree of freedom. But it's a very good indication, I would say, um, that generally um, factorization theorems that are developed in a vacuum really tell us something uh, useful um, about um, how we basically um, address calculations uh, in heavy ion collisions. So it's a very good confirmation, I think, of that, or at least it doesn't rule out that, that it doesn't that it does not work. Um, and so with this, in principle, one can then try to be a bit more, say, ambitious and try to see, can we actually also just do it for other jets, uh, jet substructure measurements? And so here, again, two examples um, from Alice. Um, as I mentioned, these um, uh, um, core gluon fractions basically now have to better be universal. So for any substructure measurement we look at, we have to basically put those in. And so what is um, shown here are two, basically now I would say standard observables that are measured frequently uh, in PP and heavy ion collisions, where you look at a groomed jet, so remove soft radiation, uh, soft branches from your jet, and then once the soft drop algorithm terminates, um, then you basically measure here the opening angle of the two um, branches that or sub subjects that remain, um, and you can measure their momentum fraction. So that's shown here on the left is the opening angle, the groomed radius, that's uh, so a peak structure here, and here uh, you can measure basically ZG, which is um, to first approximation the QCD splitting function. And so what we can do now, we can look at this factorization here. And in principle, of course, there might be some calculations we have to do specifically for ZG and for theta G, um, which of course would go beyond what we have extracted from inclusive jet data. Um, but of course we can just make an approximation or like an assumption and see how far it, it gets us. Um, is to just ignore that part. We just use this as a vacuum. And all we do is really just change here the medium core gluon fractions. And somewhat surprisingly, I would say this actually, at least in that particular case, describes the data just perfectly because ZG basically has no dependence to first approximation uh, on core gluon differences. So you expect no modification because of core gluon differences uh, in vacuum and medium. And indeed they find uh, uh, no modification here versus here, um, the prediction basically that contains the medium core gluon fractions is shown here, the UN, uh, 
medium core gluon, it's a little difficult to see the line starts here. And then if you trace it down, um, it, it basically follows the data uh, quite, quite well. Um, and that's of course pretty interesting because only by changing core gluon fractions, we can at least in that case also describe the data. Um, and so of course the question is then maybe that really is what it is. And, and then the question is where does it sort of break down? Um, where is that sort of not enough anymore? Where we sort of make the simplest possible assumption um, that we can test and, and potentially falsify um, and where does it sort of break down? And of course, happy to discuss um, uh, later uh, where it may uh, or may not break down uh, for, for other observables. Um, okay, so that's basically what I wanted to talk about uh, in the uh, first part of my talk, um, trying to see how far we can get um, using just cute new um, factorization theorems that were developed in vacuum and how far they can actually get us. Uh, in, in heavy ion collisions. And that, of course, then also I would say motivates, for example, um, calculations of these in medium jet functions, for example, uh, in, in open quantum system uh, formulation. Okay, so um, let me get to the second part um, of the talk, which is uh, generally about um, quantum computing. Um, and specifically here, um, I wanna focus on digital quantum computing. That's basically um, what also um, Bert de Jong uh, talked about on the first day, which is something that can be accessed through the cloud from various companies um, that are shown here. We're using uh, mostly the, the IBM framework uh, at the moment. And uh, Bert, for example, mentioned in our first paper, uh, we looked at basically a two level system and how that um, can evolve basically uh, in, in, so as an open quantum system that interacts with some uh, thermal uh, environment. Um, so just um, a few words about digital quantum computing that basically just means that we have a universal gate set. We start basically with some set of qubits and we can rotate them. Uh, so single qubit rotations on the Bloch sphere shown here. Um, and then we have entangling or C naught gates that basically flip the lower qubit if the upper one is in the one state. And so that's basically a way to do universal uh, quantum computations. And um, so if you have any problem that we want to solve, we can basically map it um, to these, uh, these, these operations. Um, of course, whenever we want to think about <clears throat> uh, uh, quantum computations, um, we need to think one way or another about computational complexity. So um, let me just briefly show here this, uh, uh, um, uh, this illustration here from um, Scott Aronson. Um, these are basically all the problems that we can uh, solve or can think of um, where all problems that we can solve polynomially uh, in, with a classical computer are shown here in P. Um, then anything beyond that, we don't have polynomial time algorithms. So these are problems basically in NP or even polynomial space, so P space. Um, these, are where, these are problems where we don't have um, polynomial time algorithms, but uh, at least in the case of NP problems or even the hardest ones in NP, the NP complete problems, we at least can check the solution in polynomial time. Um, so, um, but in general, they're usually scaling exponentially um, in terms of all the input parameters since we don't have a classical way of addressing these problems. Um, and so then quantum computing is basically expected to, <clears throat> of course, capture everything that's in P, but then basically um, it basically extends sort of the sphere of all the problems uh, that we can compute. Um, but often it's expected that it will not um, include these NP complete problems. Um, but of course, there's no proof of that, but that's sort of uh, somewhat of an expectation. And so the question is where, um, if you want to basically simulate um, QCD, if you want to simulate QCD scattering processes in PP or heavy ion collisions, the first question of course is where is that basically in this diagram? And the answer to that is basically not known. We don't know if QCD can be simulated efficiently with a quantum computer. So whether it's in BQP or whether it's outside. Um, so that's basically one of the main questions of the field. We have to basically understand is QCD and BQP or not. Either way, it will be a very interesting uh, question. Now, the reason though that, that um, people are very excited about this and a lot of work is going on in this direction is because of this work by Jordan Lee and Preskill, um, where they showed that actually for scalar field theory, um, scattering processes can be simulated efficiently by a quantum computer. That really means that we basically prepare, in our case, in heavy ion collisions and initial state, initial uh, ions, uh, we evolve them in time, so really just the way um, collisions happen, then we look at all the debris and we can just simulate um, that process. We can efficiently in polynomial time sample um, from this um, probability distribution in a very efficient way. Um, so that works for scalar field theory, and one has to think about, can that also work for QCDs? One has to develop algorithms for that. Um, 
Now, there are a few takeaways um, from this. Um, what they find is first, um, the scaling with energy is polynomial, but it's not a very good polynomial. So you still need a lot of resources um, if you want to go to very, very high energies. Um, so ideally, we want to first focus, if we want to sort of think about a near-term quantum advantage, we basically want to think about lower energies. But that's, of course, also OK, because high energies, we can do perturbability quite well, but we have problems with like hadronization and things like that. Um, it's also generally um, useful to focus basically on sort of a small phase space uh, instead of basically trying to simulate the entire collision. It's generally maybe useful um, to just look at, for example, an isolated phase space, so like a jet or a quaconium, and specifically look at that at low energies. That's more likely to give us a quantum advantage in the near term. Um, and so that basically directly then, of course, leads us to open quantum systems and actually also does that in um, proton proton collisions. Whenever I just look at a jet and not the entire event, I basically have to be able to simulate an open quantum system. So whether we're in heavy ion collisions or in PP collisions, this open quantum system framework is really very useful uh, and really required in a way if we want to do um, first principle simulations sort of in, in the near term future. Um, so what we've been looking at is basically. Uh, and, and as what I wanted to show and sort of the extension of what, what Bert mentioned from the two-level system is we've been looking um, at the um, so-called um, Schwinger model. Uh, the Lagrangian for the Schwinger model is shown here. It's really just quantum electrodynamics, but in one plus one dimensions. And so it's a basically a toy um, uh, field theory um, where we can basically test all of these things. But it actually goes, it's not really just a toy uh, um, a model. The interesting thing is, and it really has been used actually for phenomenology, for example, by Dima Krasiev, um, is because it basically provides a model um, for um, QCD hadronization. Um, so even though QED, of course, normally not confining, but in one plus one dimension has this very interesting feature that I'm trying to illustrate over here. If you have basically two fermions of the theory and you basically um, continue basically to um, pull them apart, um, then, uh, the uh, potential basically increases uh, linearly um, with uh, the distance. So in that sense, that's kind of a confining potential like we have in, in, in Q, QCD. And so it has actually been used a lot uh, to, to model hadronization. And, and for example, this the string breaking mechanism as it's for example implemented in Pythia can actually be sim simulated directly um, uh, with uh, uh, the Schwinger model. And so I'll show some examples of that. So in that sense, that's sort of going directly in this direction that, that we want to look at low energies um, and look at problems that we cannot address uh, uh, with perturbation theory. Um, so if you want to simulate, for example, string breaking, then we need to discretize the Schwinger model. So we need to take this Lagrangian, we need to write down the Hamiltonian, and then we need to discretize it on a spatial lattice. So we continue, of course, to keep time continuous so that eventually we can solve basically a Schrodinger type equation, um, but we'll um, basically discretize um, the spatial lattice. So the, just the, the spatial component will be discretized. Um, and so eventually, of course, we wanna take a continuum limit and basically take the lattice spacing A uh, to zero. And so what is shown here is the Hamiltonian um, for the Schwinger model. I'm not gonna go too much into details. I'm just trying to give uh, maybe some intuition for this. Um, if we, for example, now look at such a one-dimensional um, uh, uh, string um, of our lattice sites, and this is um, representing here basically the trivial vacuum where there are no fermions and no gauge fields and so on, um, then this Hamiltonian can basically generate physical states like um, they're shown here. So um, it can, for example, um, generate an E plus E minus pair on these sites. And that's basically done here in the first line by these um, operators, sigma plus minus. And then it does it in a way that we're not just generating, say, an E plus E minus pair, but we also basically generate the string or the gauge field or the electric flux in between. Uh, so that's these green lines here that are basically on the links between different fermion sites. Um, and so then basically by taking this Hamiltonian, um, we can basically study the real-time evolution um, of, of systems. And also not just perturbative in a perturbative regime, but also in, in a non-perturbative regime. And so what this um, Hamiltonian looks like, if you actually evaluate it, for example, for four lattice sites, and specifically here, we limit ourselves to just zero momentum of the total system, um, you get these kind of large matrices. And that's basically the problem. If you um, basically extend it to finite momentum, if you extend it to larger lattices, then these matrices get very, very large. And that basically makes it uh, intractable or it scales exponentially 
uh, with um, classical uh, computing. And that's where um, hopefully then quantum computing can come in and, and solve that, that problem. Um, so let me show you one example um, of what uh, we're currently working on that directly goes in this direction of hadronization and string breaking um, and how the Schwinger model can basically um, um, maybe teach us something about um, hadronization, especially if we think about it then as an open quantum system. Um, so what is shown here in this 2D histogram is basically the electric field configuration on that one dimensional um, uh, 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 spatial component um, of the field theory. And so what we're starting with here is basically this configuration where we have a string that's stretched between an E plus and minus pair. And so we, that basically means you have an electric field um, between several lattice sites and no electric field outside. And that's basically shown here. This is on the y-axis is um, the spatial um, component of this lattice here, this entire lattice that we have, um, where there's no electric field here, but then there's an electric field here in blue. That's basically this part. And then there's again, no electric field here. And then we can basically just look at um, the electric field configuration squared um, as a function um, of real time and how it evolves um, as a function of real time. And so as you can see um, here in blue, this basically the string basically stays together um, for very early times, but then it basically falls apart. And that's basically the string breaking mechanism. If you have say a, say a QCD or QQ bar pair, then that eventually that string will break. It will eventually form um, say two hadrons, or in this case, it will form basically a tightly bound um, e plus e minus pair um, that you can see here in blue, and they basically move away from each other with a certain velocity. Um, and then of course, our lattice is you know, relatively small, so that will sort of bounce back and so on. So these are just effects sort of from, from the finite lattice. And so what we're currently working on is basically trying to understand um, how this basically this vacuum process now changes um, in, in, in the medium. And so we can hopefully, you know, even if we cannot directly simulate this with a quantum computer, hopefully even sort of in the very near term future, we can maybe learn something interesting um, just by basically thinking about it in that, that way and studying uh, real time uh, dynamics. Um, now, this is actually very difficult. I think I'm probably slowly running out of time, but let me show. Uh, you, you still have two minutes. Yeah. I still have two minutes. Okay, perfect. That's, that's just right. Thanks. <laughs> Um, so this, this is a little difficult to actually simulate on a quantum computer, it's even very difficult to do on a classical computer. Um, but what we can do is um, basically simplify the problem a little bit, and then we can study an open quantum system. So we still want to have the Schwinger model as our system, and that now interacts with somehow like a scalar field theory. That's the example we're using. So we have this Hamiltonian with a Schwinger model with an environment where we just have a scalar field theory, and then we have an interacting Hamiltonian where this environment, we're basically taking it to be in thermal equilibrium, and then we're coupling it with an interacting Hamiltonian here um, to this, the, the fermions of the, of the theory. So not to the gauge field, uh, but we're coupling it basically directly as illustrated here um, to the fermion degrees uh, of freedom through this Yukawa coupling. And then we can basically study these kind of non-equilibrium dynamics. Um, so we're not looking here specifically at, uh, at string breaking, but we're looking uh, sort of like trivial vacuum fluctuations. So we just start with a trivial vacuum, then we let the system evolve in time. And so, of course, we want to do open quantum systems. I guess it can be quite quick here. It was um, covered by very nice talks already today and, and, and yesterday, where we not only interested, say, in, in, of course, pure states, but we want to have a density matrix. Um, we want to trace out the environmental degrees of freedom, then write down a little that type of evolution equation, which is something we can do. We're working here in the quantum Brownian motion limit. Um, and if we limit ourselves to basically zero momentum, that was basically the matrix I showed before, we can write on actually a very uh, a simple uh, Lindblad evolution equation, which you can see here. In that particular case, if you just have zero momentum, it's actually just one Lindblad operator. Um, and so then, of course, it goes in the direction of something that we can actually do uh, with a quantum computer basically right now. Um, <clears throat> and of course, that is also a large matrix, and it will be evaluated on like the lattice and, and so on and so forth. Um, one question is still how we actually simulate um, the uh, Lindblad evolution equation because it's a non-unitary evolution equation. Whereas on a quantum computer, um, that's of course fine if we just you know uh, solve this this basically directly with say the uh, method. Um, but on a quantum computer, that's basically a problem because this is non-unitary, um, and so we have to basically think about how we can put this non-unitary evolution on a quantum computer that can just do uh, unitary evolution. And so one way to do this. 
um, that we used here is to use this um, so-called Steinspring dilation theorem, where you basically make your Hilbert space larger, um, and you basically have uh, an operator that acts on additional ancillary qubits that are reset after every small time step delta t, and then basically always in between you evolve once with a system Hamiltonian only. And this larger operator that acts both on the system we're interested in and um, some ancillas, um, that basically contains here um, the Lindblad operator. And through this reset, basically at every time step by using these additional ancillas, we can basically introduce something that's time irreversible. And that allows us to, to actually simulate um, non-unitary evolution on a quantum computer. And so um, before coming to conclusions, let me just show these results. I think Bert also showed these um, briefly uh, in his talk. Um, now here we're not looking basically at the electric field at specific lattice sites, but we're just looking at sort of the average of, over everything. And we're looking at um, specifically these vacuum fluctuations. So we start basically with no electric field over the entire lattice, and then we just let it evolve as a function of time. If we were to just look at this in vacuum, you basically just find sort of these um, vacuum oscillations. So you have basically E plus and minus pairs like popping in out of existence. Um, that's shown here basically in this light blue color. So you get some characteristic fluctuations. Um, but if we then basically go to the open quantum system, we see very quickly a deviation um, from uh, the closed system. And actually, if we um, evolve for a sufficiently long time, uh, eventually this will approximate here um, the thermal equilibrium, which is here shown by the dashed uh, uh, green line. And so the points that you can see here with, you know, with or without error corrections, um, they're really coming here from, from the IBM uh, quantum devices, um, where we're running a circuit with six qubits. 200 C naught gates, that's a very large number, and uh, 500 single qubit rotations. Um, so that's basically, um, at least at the time when we were running, this was sort of the maximum that, that we could uh, get out of the machine. But it's, it's of course still relatively small, but I think the, the reason why we were quite, quite excited about this is there's actually a significant improvement compared to basically just a few months or half a year earlier. Uh, so these, the technology is really uh, evolving very uh, quickly. And so it's very exciting, I think. Uh, to, to look at these kind of things uh, um, uh, at, this, at this point. All right, so let me come to my conclusion. So I first talked about um, how we can try to understand uh, QCD factorization, in particular, um, how we can understand heavy ion observables by extending QCD factorization to the medium case, which of course motivates further theory studies. And um, specifically, uh, the low energy aspects of this um, hopefully not in the in the not too distant future, we'll be able to really learn uh, about these kind of things uh, using quantum computing, specifically open quantum systems, which I mentioned is relevant both in vacuum and uh, in the medium. And of course, there's a lot of things to do and, and the development is in the very early stages. Um, so with that, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Felix, for the very nice talk. Um, now we have uh, question time. Um, yeah, anyone, if you have a question, just raise up your hand, I will call you. Um, yeah, it, yeah, we'll, we'll, yeah. While people are thinking about their questions, Felix, I want to ask you a question, a bit technical about the inclusive jet functions you introduced. Um, um, like if I think about defining the, if I think about defining this jet function using SET, um, do you ha only have collinear modes in it? Yes, 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 right. There's no, I, <coughs> so, for the like, if you don't perform any additional substructure measurement, there's no soft modes. Okay, that's right. It's it's a purely collinear object. Um, like, it's it's basically very different if you were to measure like exclusive jets. But if mm -hmm. you, for example, measure dijet event in E plus E minus, then you immediately are sensitive to soft physics. But the interesting thing here is that you basically just have a collinear jet function, and that's it. It's basically because of this inclusiveness of the measurement, and that you're sort of integrating over everything else. It's not observed in a way. But, um, mm -hmm. that basically gets rid of the soft mode. Um, and so if you then measure jet substructure, you will have soft modes, but they will basically be um, confined to the jet itself. So to the substructure and not to the entire event. Yeah, okay, I see. Right, right. So here, like the soft radiation is, is kind of uh, globally distributed. And by, by, doing, by doing the inclusive measurements, all those soft modes are kind of integrated out. Yes, right, right. It's, it's, it's very similar to, right, like if, if you were to think of like hadron fragmentation functions, right, then also that's basically a purely collinear factorization, right? So it's not sort of making use of the full de sector decomposition of, of, of soft and effective theory. Right? Um, 
And that sort of makes it a little simpler, right, to write down um, like jet substructure because the logs, right, or, or the observables really are just here, right, in the jet function once you look at sub jet substructure. Because, mm -hmm. um, right, you, you just, like in, in, in the measurement of the jet function, right, you're integrating out over everything else in the event, and that basically makes it insensitive to it. Um, okay, yeah. Like, is, is, is there a constraint on the R, the, the jet radius? Like, do you require it to be much smaller than one? So the soft contamination can be neglected. So yeah, so so in principle, no, so it's it's still gonna be collinear. Like in principle, you have correction to this of order r squared, or you have uh -huh. like like or generally you have power corrections. Um for some reason, like they, they're not known analytically um for the inclusive case. They're known, I think, for some specific cases um in E plus C minus for exclusive jet production. Um they're not known for the inclusive case here. Um, they're also, so even in the exclusive case, they're relatively small. Like even if you go to R of one, you're still good. Mm -hmm. And they're even smaller here because you have cancellations between in and out of jet radiation that you don't have in the exclusive case. So they're even smaller. So um, in principle, I think you can, to a large extent, neglect, neglect them. Um, that's of course, like to, to some extent, that's a little bit like, <laughs> like not completely satisfying, right? Because you would like to understand why they're so small, right? Basically, for any observable we ever looked at, we never found. Like you can compute them, of course, at fixed order, right? But analytically, or doing a subleading power resummation is not known. It would be good to do that, right? Um, but basically, okay. phenomenologically, you just always find that they just turn out to be irrelevant. Okay. But in principle, there are definitely power corrections to this. But it would be power corrections to the colonial factorization. Yeah. Okay. And, and a final technical question: mm -hmm. Like when you write down the definition of this chat function. You, would you will have a, a theta function for the jet finding algorithm and another delta function to constrain about the final kinematics. I mean, the, 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 the eta and the pt should be related to the z. Is, is, is that how? Yeah. So, right. I mean, so, so operationally, right, it's a little difficult to write down, um, right? It's, it's, it's because it's like algorithmically defined, right? And so like writing down an operator definition usually doesn't tell you a whole lot because it just say, well, I take a jet, right? And that's it, right? But of course, if you, right? So here at, at, at NLO, right? The jet algorithm is basically just defined by the angle, right? And by energy, right. Right? so it's very simple, right? But as soon as you go to this kind of configuration, it gets much more complicated, right? Right, right. And so then it's of course, you, you can't really account for that, right? In, in like a, I mean, you can sort of implicitly account for it in a um, formal definition, right? Um, but you basically just, in a formal definition, you would just write down a jet and then it's defined algorithmically order by order perturbation theory. Oh, I see. Uh, like, like I, I tried to follow a strategy used a lot by, by Ian, like you write down a jet function or solve function and you have, you calculate them at one loop, you extract mm -hmm. the anomalous dimension and then you do the QCD evolution, right? Right, right. right. Um, like, did, did you follow the same strategy here? Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, then, then I just uh, want to ask like how you calculate the jet function. Like, Do you mean how, how this is computed? Yes, right. Right, right. So you, you take the colonial phase space, um, the colonial matrix element squared, and then you put in your jet constraints, right? So you basically consider these kind of um, configurations, right? Like are right. they, right? If they're sufficiently close together, right? It will be proportional to a delta function, you integrate over it. Um, if they're too far apart, you basically do two measurements, right? Um, mm -hmm. It's like independent of Z, right? There's no constraint on Z. Z is between zero and one. So whether the inclusive oh, jet is like the quark or it's the gluon, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you basically account for both um, both of those, right? And that would basically give you this, you know, non-trivial uh, functional dependence on Z. And it really goes down to zero, right? Like in, you have a log Z in here. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's basically cut off through the factorization, right? But the jet function itself contains a log in Z and it really goes down in principle all the way down to zero. Um, yeah. So you would, I mean, there, there are like additional logs in here, right? There's a log Z, there are threshold logs, right? Um, the, the, the threshold log is actually resumed. I, I didn't discuss that in detail, but that basically gives you this one here, the, the peak structure. Um, but there are also these kind of things in here that um, would basically require further refactorization. Mm -hmm. but, but this Z is integrated in the final observable. Yeah, so it's basically integrated here against the hard function. And so, so, I, so I wrote down yeah. here like three convolution integrals. These are not really convolution integrals. Only the last one is a convolution. Only the last one, yeah. Right, right. But these one are, you know, some integrals. <laughs> or, right. You know, so those are, are the relating static. rapidity and PT yeah. and, and whatever, right? Um, but that's basically so, the same as for Hadron production. But this one is, is a convolution, right? And so you're integrating whatever comes out here against the jet function. 
Mm -hmm. And so your PT basically appears here in that convolution. So rapidity, center of mass energy, um, and PT uh, appear in sort of the, the constraints in that integral here. Yeah, right. It, it's basically Q times Z equals the, the PT times something to some power of eta. It's it's there's like a cost that's a, so you mean you mean the lower cost eta right PT there's like some cost eta and two PT over center of mass energy or something like that yeah yeah right and so it's 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 fixed by really external variables right that's important so like for example that's why if, if you go to heavy iron right you have the same heart function right you you produce the same jets basically right mm -hmm. but it's completely fixed by the final by center of mass energy and final measure measurable quantities mm -hmm. um in in that case right. Right. Yeah. And, and and so so in some way, right? If if you look at like inclusive, um, if you look at this measurement here, right, it's basically sensitive to an integral of this, right? An integral mm -hmm. of this against the heart function, right? Yes, Ver heart. Right. Versus um, if you look at this um, subjects, right, then it's much more directly the jet function, right? Mm -hmm. Like here you actually see like this behavior, right? Like, like for the inclusive PT spectrum, right, there's no peak, right? It's z equals one. Like you don't even get to z equals one, right? And it's basically because you convolve with a heart function. That doesn't allow you to see the peak, I right? See. But here, the heart function that still is here as well, right? That you integrate against that allows you to actually see the peak. Um, so this is much closer to like you know seeing sort of the shape of the jet function in data than the inclusive uh, jet spectrum alone. Okay, right. thank you. Yeah, I, I, I shouldn't use that all the time. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, it, it's Migo or, or somebody. I, I. No, I have a small question. So, in the regarding the Swinger model at the final temperature that uh -huh. you show, uh, why do you know that the E square goes to thermal equilibrium? Is is that obvious at large time? Yeah, um, you know that it go to the dash line. Is it obvious? I mean, you you expect it to to thermalize the way, the way we set it up. Um, right. If if you just solve this, right. I mean, it's independent of the, you know, quantum computation. Right. If you just solve this thing, then eventually you will uh, uh, reach thermal equilibrium at some point, right? Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I mean, it, well, it's not that obvious to me. I mean, it's obvious that, that you will arrive to some steady state, but it's not obvious to me that it corresponds to to thermal equilibrium. Um, yeah, I think there can be like some special cases where, where you don't, well, there, yes, I, I guess that generally could be true, um, but here we basically just check that it, that it does it, like the way it's set up it, right, I mean, we just computer this by hand, right, and it, and it does it. And it, okay, okay, so it happens that it is this way. Okay. Right, right, and right, right. I, you, you, you can plug in the thermal density matrix into the limb blood equation, and then you will find uh, the thermal density matrix it is in the null space of, of the uh, evolution. So it's oh, basically okay. you get a zero on the right hand side. Yeah. Okay, 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 I see. Right, yeah. right. But it but right, it's, like it doesn't have to happen, right? Like yeah, right. You like, you can you can more, more than one static state, but that's right. that is is guaranteed. Right, but I think it's probably excluded in like the simple setup that yeah. that we used here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Mike, can you just unmute yourself and ask a question? Yeah, so I, I just have a just practical question since we're on this slide. So <clears throat> here you compare just normal Runga Kutta fourth order in the open system case with you know the full quantum computing uh, answer. What is the how how long does it take currently to run the RK for RK four versus the quantum simulation? Oh, it's much quicker. Um. <laughs> I, th yeah. I mean, for for you know, like those those kind of problems, right? Um, like it's 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 much faster and, and reliable, right? To to do it um, with with uh, like a, you know wrong a cut um, method um, than than with the quantum computing, right? This is more like an illustration that we're not just getting out noise, right? Yeah. So for example, right? I understand that we're, we're right, forward right, thinking. Right. I'm just trying to understand where are we at now? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So right, what right, is right. the ratio of the time it took to, to run it on IBM Q versus RK4? Oh, it's, uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure what they're, so RK4 it's I think done almost immediately because right? a very small system. Um, this is like run with, uh, was it like four lattice sites, right? So it's pretty small. And that's something that can be done without 
like on, on some IBM, I mean, like the problem with IBM is that, so what we're doing here is basically average over certain mm -hmm. um, areas um, and we do the error correction. So the error correction takes long if you just want to run this without error correction, which actually works for you quite well, right? If you look at the uncorrected, the light blue actually works surprisingly well, uh, I would say. Um, that's something also that can be done basically in one run on IBM, which also, I don't know, maybe takes a couple minutes. Um, what, what takes a really long time are like these error corrections um, because you basically, or the way we set it up is that we're basically trading number of shots um, for, to basically do like a zero noise extrapolation. Um, we're trading that for like identity insertions and the C0 gates that are difficult to do. Um, and so that really takes a long time. And especially because like, you know, there's a, a queue right in IBM and you have to wait for it and, and so on. So the error correction, I would say takes a very long time just running uh, the uncorrected is, is, is pretty quick. Um, yeah, yeah, Miko. Oh. Yes, I have a, a, a small question now that looking at this plot, it, it seems like the error corrected is worse, is worse than the, the one without the error correction. So is this so, or I'm understanding the plot yeah, so, so I, I was probably a little bit quick here, so sorry about that. So um, what is shown here first is basically the full solution, right, which is uh, this RK4, the, the red one. Yeah, uh, That's basically the full solution. Then if you go to just a simulator, and so what we're basically doing here with the quantum algorithm, we run four cycles. And so in principle, you have to run many cycles if you want to go to late times, right? And so what you can see here in the simulator um, is this, I don't know, blue or so, right? Um, that basically lies here. So that's basically what we're aiming for with a quantum algorithm. So you can see it agrees up to here with a perfect solution, right? If you want to make it agree here as well, you have to run more cycles. So you basically, you know, in this algorithm, you have to run more cycles to actually make it agree, right? And so that's basically what we're aiming for. And you can see that here, um, like, like, so what we're aiming for, this is with a full error correction, right? That one on average basically agrees better uh, with this blue line, right? So we're not aiming for the red, we're aiming for the, the blue. Oh, okay. so that overall, uh, I would say agrees better, but there are certainly large fluctuations in there, right? Because so, just 200 C0 gates is, is a lot. Um, yeah. oh, okay, okay, thank you. Thanks, thanks, yeah. good point. Yeah, I have a quick comment on, on this, like, that the Schwinger model, even if we just do 20 spatial lattice size, the Hilbert space, the dimension of the Hilbert is crazily large, like it goes to billions of, uh, I mean, in the dimension. So it, it's impossible to do that on a classical computer anymore. It, then you have to go to the quantum computer you because the qubits can say anything re, re, reduce the, 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 the resources needed in, in the simulation. Oh, right, it, right, not, right. Right, yeah, like right. The, the problem like of this entire thing is like one, it's like the fermions are a problem, right? How we implement those, but also the gauge field, right? So we, for example, we're, I mean, maybe I can just show this one more time, um, like here, right? We basically, this is like a gauge field. So it's like a boson where we can have in principle many gauge fields here, right? And we're basically just limiting ourselves to having at most one gauge field on these, these connections here. Right? Um, and even that already gives you a, a super large Hilbert space, right? And that's sort of this, this exponential scaling. And one may have to then basically think about more efficient implementations also, right, of this even on, on the quantum computer than, than what we've been using. Um, but that, that's one of the main problems, sort of like how to implement a gauge field efficiently. And that's like, an, you know, an open question is like one of the, one of the main reasons that we don't know if, if especially non abelian gauge theories can be simulated on, on quantum computers efficiently. Right. Yeah, I just saw an, another raised hand. Is Eric? Or, or do you still want to ask your question? Um, no, it, it got answered. Okay, cool. Okay, a final round for question calls. If no more questions, then we should move on to the next talk. Uh, we're a bit behind in the schedule.